Welcome everyone, and I propose that we start. It's on, right? Yeah, it's on. <coughs> I propose that we uh, that we start. <laughs> thanks, thanks. Uh, welcome once again, everyone. My name is Elle Rutten. I am Professor of Russian and Slavic Studies here at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, I'm also co-founder of the University of New Europe, a university in the making at which we plan to allocate more than half of the student and staff positions to students and academics at risk from Ukraine and from Belarus and Russia. And that institution can use all the support uh, that it can get, so I mention its name here too. University of New Europe, please do not forget uh, this name. Tonight I have the honor of introducing and moderating a discussion about cultural identities and Ukrainian and co Russian cultural identities in particular with two wonderful guest speakers for whom I ask an especially warm welcome and whom I will introduce in a moment in more detail. I want to start by sharing five observations. I told myself not to forget something for that list of five things or observations, but I did forget. I will go and get it and then go back here. <laughs> okay, five things. This evening is part, that's one. This evening is part of the lecture series, Ukraine and Russia. Ukraine, we mentioned first, Russia second. Ukraine and Russia, the imagination of a region. Two, this lecture series is offered to you this spring by our student organization and the Eastern European Stu Studies Student Organization. Um, and it's meant for wider audiences, um, but it's also obligatory for students of a new University of Amsterdam course that my wonderful colleagues created at lightning speed this spring, devoted to Ukrainian and Russian language, literature and cultural history. Uh, in fact, I was even told uh, that uh, students of this course were, were told to take selfies here. I think selfies maybe even together with me to prove that they actually attended. <laughs> but we, we promised to, to, to organize this differently. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just realized I'm going to tell you four things, not five. This was the second thing. The third thing, along this, alongside this series, this same spring, our colleagues of the Eastern European Studies Programme also offer a weekly uh, lecture series that we co-conceptualize together with them, titled Dot UA Discussions, which is, and this series is meant to provide students and general public with a reliable, comm reliable commentary on Ukraine's history, culture, society, and politics. In fact, tomorrow's speaker in that series is also here, William Blacker. He is a, a wonderful expert uh, on uh, one, one of the world's uh, best-known experts on Ukrainian literature, and he will speak here also in Amsterdam tomorrow at 6 p.m. So, dot UA discussions. That was thing number three. Thing number four, and here it comes, this weekend, um, this latest edition of our um, uh, teaching team the, the, and our teaching program, the Slavic Studies program in Amsterdam, of our home journal, the Tijdschrift voor Slavische Literatuur, Journal of Slavic Literature, this weekend it landed in my home mailbox and from the cover you can see to which national literary tradition this special volume is devoted. The issue, put together with hyperlightning speed by again my wonderful colleagues, contains translated poetry and prose fragments from such Ukrainian or part Ukrainian authors as Ilya Kaminsky, Luba Yakimchuk and Andrei Kurkov, as well as a very short history of Ukrainian literature. I can highly recommend it, uh, this volume to you. Now, why am I sharing this enumeration of recent and upcoming events, lectures and publications with you? Not so much to advertise, I mean, you can tell from how I share them that I'm enthusiastic about them, but I'm sharing them because they illustrate the drastic extent to which, since February 24 this year, scholars in Slavic and Eastern European studies have started to shift their gaze towards Ukraine. Ukraine and Ukrainian history and its cultural and literary heritage, one could say, has suddenly landed squarely on the mental and intellectual map of Slavic studies. And just as suddenly, studying the Ukrainian language and its cultural practices and traditions has become uh, a symbol of strength and resistance, as one recent comment in The Guardian puts it. 
In tonight's program, we both applaud that move, and, but we also problematize the fact that it took a war for this mental and intellectual Ukraine shift to happen. Where is and where was the past years Ukraine on the mental map of the academic community? That question is a question that our special guest tonight, writer and uh, scholar Olesia Chromechuk, will ponder together with you in a moment. And why don't we listen more attentively to Central and Eastern Europe's own identity narratives rather than reading them in terms of Western and often simplifying schemes and thoughts? That is the central question of a short introductory talk by our second speaker, Slavist and culture historian Arendt van Nieuwkerken. So both talks ask for self-reflection, and that's a practice in which our field is engaging quite actively at the moment. In the past months, I've talked with many colleagues and students, also some uh, students who are here today, um, about the self-reflective and also self-critical thoughts that the Russian war in Ukraine, which, mind you, started in the early 2010s, not 2022, has triggered in our field this year. Many of us now look with new eyes at our study programs. And it's maybe good to add that's not because we, we want a total Slavic studies revolution or because we want to throw overboard all classics, but because we feel that we as academics have a responsibility in unlocking public knowledge about the eastern parts of our continent and because we feel that maybe, maybe we should unlock that knowledge in slightly different ways here and there. Um, and this sort of self-reflective gesture is also taking place because we feel a responsibility in countering easy assumptions about Central and Eastern European cultural and local identities, the topic of tonight's programme. Um, of course, it's in part due to very practical, trivial things, such as budget cuts, that we don't always fulfil that role as ideally as we want to right now. In Amsterdam, for instance, we had courses in Ukrainian, in Ukrainian, Ukra Ukrainian language, well, they were simply expensive, so that is why they have been uh, abolished at some point. Um, but there is also, among other problems, this serious problem of a thwarted balance of knowledge. Academic knowledge about other parts of Euro Eastern Europe than Russia is both heavily underfinanced and heavily underdeveloped uh, uh, in other ways. And that is a problem not only for structural intellectual reasons, but also for political reasons, for safety reasons, and for moral reasons. So the violence that we witness in Ukraine today is perhaps not directly caused by you know, how, how we finance academic programs, but it can certainly not be fully isolated from that problem. So this evening is meant as a response to the need to reassess our mental and academic map of Europe and to reinvestigate um, Central and Eastern European cultural identities in particular. And we will do so in a program that looks as follows. We start with a, um, well, ten, five, ten-ish minute introduction by Arendt van Nieuwkerken. Arendt van Nieuwkerken is a lecturer at the Department of Slavic Studies at Amsterdam University. He's also a foreign member of the Polish Academy of Sciences, and he has been a visiting professor at Warsaw University and the Nicolas Copernicus University of Torun, um, and his research focuses on Polish, Ukrainian and Russian literature and their relation with national and regional identities. He's the author of Studies uh, of Modernist Polish Poetry in Anglo-Saxon Contexts, um, the author of Studies of Norwids, uh, romant Romantism, among other publications, and he was also just nominated as uh, Teacher of the Year uh, at our own university just last week. Yes, yes, but that's <laughs> off topic. <laughs> Actually, I think, what was it? Well, 620, 622 nominations, so we haven't quite won the prize yet, but Arendt was certainly one of the nominees. Uh, Olesia Chromichuk is director. Uh, so uh, this is Arendt who will share, uh, as I said, a, a short introductory lecture, and that will be followed uh, by Olesia Chromichuk's lecture, and to sort of not make things, you know, busier and more hectic than they are, I will introduce also Olesia straight away now. She's director of the Ukrainian Institute London. Uh, she's a historian of 20th century Europe, 
specializing in Ukrainian history. She has a PhD in history from University College London and taught at King's College London, University College London and the University of Cambridge, among a number of other institutions. She's the author of Undetermined Ukrainians, um, a study published by Peter Lang in 2013, and also of a book that has received wide international uh, acclaim. And this is the memoir essay, combination of memoir and essay, A Loss, the story of a dead soldier told by his sister. This was published by Columbia University last year. And in that book, Olesia combines memories of her brother who lost, who fought and lost his life in the Russian war in Ukraine in the early 2010s. She combines that with theoretical reflections on loss and trauma. So we have the short lecture by Ant. We have a somewhat longer lecture by Olesia. Together, all of that is roughly one hour, and then we open the floor um, uh, to you, to questions from you, from the audience. And, and I really look forward also to those questions, so we'll make sure to, um, to leave some time for that. Thank you very much, and I'll pass the floor to Arendt. So I hope you can hear me, uh, everything okay. Uh, today I'm attempting to give a short introduction about identity narratives in the context of the Russian war of aggression against Ukraine. Uh, I'm quite aware that in doing so, I am speaking from a particular perspective, which we use, usually identify as Western. This Western perspective is characterized by a certain distance to non-Western, in this case, East European, or as many East Europeans would prefer, prefer East Central European events. Uh, this distance is linked to a more or less conscious feeling of uh, invulnerability, and one of its negative consequences might be that we involuntarily start to act as a mediator, or even worse, a judge, or that we attempt to look at what is happening from both sides, trying to be balanced and reasonable, which can only infuriate people who are victims of aggression. Uh, what they demand from us is solidarity and assistance, uh, perhaps military assistance. And what they receive are, uh, I use a phrase uh, of the Polish poet Zbigniew Herbert, who, uh, a 20th century poet, sex of well-wishing. Uh, this uh, Western invulnerability is, of course, not a sociological or geopolitical category. While hearing about the fate of Bucha and so many other Ukrainian towns and villages, the atrocities committed by the Russian military, and looking at pictures from Mariupol and the soldiers defending the besieged Azov steel complex, I begin to understand Czesław Miłosz, another Polish poet, 20th century poet, when he wrote his famous poem about a poor Christian Christian looking at the ghetto, the Warsaw ghetto, in spite of many differences. We are in the West in a far better situation than Miłosz was in German Nazi-occupied Warsaw. Uh, these words show my perspective. I am a practitioner of Polish literary and cultural studies who is also interested in Russia, in Ukraine and Russia. What I now will attempt to do is to relativize from this perspective our more or less conscious mainstream Western narrative about Ukraine and Russia. And in order to save time, I will simplify to the utmost. It will be very crude. Um, this mainstream narrative is a reflection of previous Western narratives about East Central Europe. It constructs nations like Ukraine, Poland, Belarus, Lithuania, etc., as belonging to an area of non-determination, a cultural void which awaits determination either by Russia, once the Soviet Union, or by Europe, the West. Uh, in its most crude form, this narrative takes as its point of departure the year 1945, the Conference of Yalta. Um, in other cases, it reaches back till the beginning of the 19th century or the end of the 18th century when Western modernity started. Uh, it is uh, uh, assumed that East Central Europe did not play an independent role in the development of modernity, uh, that at best it imitated Western forms of it or at worst that it remained to be a, a, a void to be filled by stronger or more civilized uh, identities, Russian or Western. 
Uh, East Central Europe, in this case Ukraine, is overlooked as a creator of identities of its own, which from a cultural or political point of view might be interesting to us. Westerners. The reason of this lack of attention is that they belong to a past which we think irrelevant, because it is pre-modern. Uh, by the way, this indetermination of East Central Europe by the West could also be weaponized, uh, used positively, as was rather perversely done by the Polish author Witold Gombrowicz, who suggested that it might be an antidote against European, particularly French, immobility, a symptom of decadence, which according to him was internalized by the Polish elite. Um, a lot has been said about Russian-Ukrainian rivalry with regard to the origins of, e of a East Slavic uh, political and cultural entity, Rus of Kiev, Kyiv. Uh, I will not go into this, uh, that issue. Instead, I will point to another element of Ukrainian identity, uh, the Cossack tradi tradition, which was linked to institutions which could be interpreted as a forerunner of uh, uh, modern uh, di uh, democracy. The reason of my interest is that it plays a role in uh, Polish Romanticism, which forced me to look at Ukrainian Romanticism, uh, so uh, hence my interest in Ukraine. Uh, this tradition uh, developed uh, in opposition, mostly in opposition, to a political entity which played a major role in East Central Europe between the 15th and 18th 18th century, a political union between the Kingdom of Poland and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, which in 1569 was transformed into the Commonwealth of Two Nations, the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth. Both Ukraine and Belarus played a major role in it, particularly the nobility, but ethnic, social and religious conflicts led to its gradual weakening and it succumbed to the pressure of its neighbors ruled by absolute monarchs. This commonwealth developed democratic institutions, though they were limited only to the nobility and part of the clergy. The Cossack Rebellion, um, uh, 1648, uh, was a reaction against uh, the nobleman's oppression of the peasantry and the fact that the originally Ukrainian and Belarusian or Ruthenian nobility gradually started to adopt a Polish identity, which one could perhaps call self-colonization, although there are all, also other meanings of that term, self-colonization. Um, uh, um, still, this Cossack state, which came into being as a result of this uh, rebellion, um, uh, the Khmelnytsky rebellion, that is Polish, it would be in Ukrainian Khmelnytsky, I think, um, uh, um, the Cossack state, the Hetmanate, which enjoyed a form of independence and autonomy, which was uh, later suppressed by Peter II, the Great, uh, who accused the Hetman Ivan Mazepa of betrayal, uh, this Cossack state did not away with some of the institutions of the Commonwealth, remaining faithful to its democratic uh, spirit, of course, democratic um, uh, in the context of these times. Um, this political background is not without relevance for contemporary Ukraine, uh, though you can tell a lot more about it, uh, uh, probably, if you would like to do so, but perhaps you have other plans. Um, this political background is not without relevance for contemporary Ukraine, and it shows that its identity and institutions are not only based on imitating the West. It is important for us, Western Europeans and also Americans, to keep this in mind, to make ourselves familiar with these native, in the best sense of the word, traditions, and acknowledge them. If we fail to do so, due to our ignorance, though we uh, often think and act in good faith, we might unwittingly contribute to an anti-Western backlash, as has happened in Poland a few years ago. We must try not to orientalize, uh, which of course is also a term which uh, uh, requires a lot of discussion. We must try not to orientalize East Central Europe and attentively listen to its own identity narratives. At knowing them, we will perhaps also learn something about ourselves. Thank you. Hello, good evening. Um, can you hear me? 
and can you see me? <laughs> because I appreciate you can. Yeah, okay. No, no, some of you can't. No, not as not as well as you would like to. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, Thank you so much for coming here tonight uh, and thank you very much to Ellen Rutten and to Jennifer Duren uh, for inviting me to speak here today. Uh, Amsterdam has a very special place in my heart um, because my eldest brother uh, spent many years here uh, and I sort of half expect him to walk through the door and say something outrageous uh, and inappropriate, I don't know, or just ask me, what's up, what are you doing here, why didn't you tell me? Of course that's not going to happen, uh, but it's a warming thought to imagine his presence here uh, as I walk through the streets. So thank you for making that journey for me. Um, okay, so let me begin my talk. This is a European war that just happened to start in eastern Ukraine. That is what my brother told me, explaining his choice to go back to the front line in 2017, soon after he was killed in action. Russia's war against Ukraine did not start on the 24th of February 2022. It started in 2014 with the occupation of Crimea and parts of Donbass. The reason why the Kremlin, the Kremlin was able to escalate it in 2022 was because Russia got away with violating international law and invading a sovereign state unpunished. The world responded with little more than deep concern to campaigns of aggression and terror conducted by Russia for eight years in Ukraine. Vladimir Putin felt emboldened by the West doing business as usual and the revenue from oil and gas financed not only the continuation of the war but also its escalation to full-scale invasion. After the 24th of February 2022, Ukraine dominated the headlines in the media all over the world. Outlets in the English language finally got the spelling of Ukrainian cities right, at least symbolically releasing the country from the Russian imperial embrace. Ukrainian politicians became household names all over Europe, and the high streets of cities and towns were painted blue and yellow with flags on official buildings, as well as posters drawn by children in windows of residential houses. The Western world was discovering Ukraine. And, as has often been the case with the Western world, it was discovering something that in actual fact has been in existence for centuries. As a historian with something of a pu public profile, I was contacted by numerous journalists asking to comment on Russia's invasion of Ukraine. The motivation was often the first question they wanted to discuss. In his essay, Putin says that Ukrainians and Russians are the same people. Is there any validity to that claim? Asked the ones that tried not to offend. Are you yourself Russian or Ukrainian? Ukraine was part of Russia once, right? Asked others who did not mind displaying their ignorance. In both cases, the journalists thought that their attempt to get um, to the bottom of how exactly Ukraine was different from Russia um, served to demystify Putin's version of history. However, few of them saw the essay on the historical unity of Russians and Ukrainians, which Putin published on the eve of, the, of Ukraine's 30th anniversary of independence, and the summer before the full-scale invasion, was no less than a weapon of war. Once he had denied Ukraine's existence in words, he proceeded to attack it with tanks and bombs. It was only when Putin started demonstrably to do his worst to destroy Ukraine as a state um, that the world noticed the largest country within Europe. It was only when Ukrainians dis displaced by the Russian bombs started to flood EU cities that the world realized that the country it thought of as small had a population of over 40 million people. It was only when the Russian troops started to commit horrific war crimes that the world began to see what the Russian world, propagated by the Kremlin through its propaganda channels, really looked like. It looked like the mass graves in Irpin and Bucha. It looked like Mariupol, raised to the ground by Russian shelling. It took Russophone Ukrainians standing in front of Russian tanks with nothing but blue and yellow flags for the world to understand that Putin's lies about divided Ukraine were simply that, lies. The lies that had been amplified by the world's media for years. For years, we also said never again. <laughs> 
while commemorating the dead of the Second World War. But what did we really mean by that? When my brother was killed in 2017, most West Europeans did not even remember that there was a war raging in Eastern Europe. Instead, the international community was preoccupied with the destruction of the Russian opposition by Putin's regime, while the leader of that opposition compared the illegally occupied Crimea to a sandwich that cannot be, uh, that cannot be passed back and forth, thereby accepting the grab of Ukrainian territory as a modern-day Anschluss. Some Europeans chose to focus on their guilt for Russia's losses in the Second World War, conveniently forgetting that Soviet does not equate to Russian, and that during the Second World War, Ukrainians suffered both Nazi and Soviet occupations. Seven decades after the Second World War, when the sovereignty of Ukraine was once again denied by an irredentist state, Russia, the aggressor continued to be perceived as an ally and a victim, in World War II, and the world continued to turn a bland, blind eye to Russia's aggression, both historic and current. Never again did not seem to apply when it came to preventing the war in Ukraine. For years, Ukrainians have been asking to be taken seriously, not as a territory within Russia's sphere of influence. Have we forgotten what happened last time Europe was split into spheres of influence? Not as just another portion of a post-Soviet blur. Will we still be referring to that region as post-Soviet in another three decades? Ukrainians were asking to be taken for what they are, citizens of a sovereign, democratic, European nation with a complex history, diverse identity, somewhat chaotic politics, but a clear vision of the future in which freedom to choose its own destiny was worth fighting and dying for. Ukrainians only won the trust of the democratic world after months of shedding blood in an all-out war and relying on little more but their own defiance. My brother was killed at the front at the time when the world was cautious to trust Ukrainians, tolerated Russia's propaganda, and did not wish to risk losing economic com comforts for the sake of the freedom of a nation somewhere in the post-Soviet space. His was one of 14,000 lost lives that went unnoticed by many outside of Ukraine. I wrote my book about his death before the full-scale invasion of Ukraine to use the privilege that living in Western Europe gave me to remind the world that our freedom here in Western Europe is just as fragile as that of our fellow Ukrainians in Ukraine. I wrote it because I understood that if we do not help Ukrainians fight for it, sooner or later we will have to fight for it too. I did not take much notice of my brother's warning in 2017, just before he was killed in Donbass. In February 2022, as Russia staged the full-scale invasion of Ukraine, I thought of it every day. I knew, now I knew, that this really is truly a European war that just happened to start in Eastern Ukraine. Things have changed since the full-scale invasion of Ukraine. On the 24th of February 2022, the contours of the map of Ukraine lit up um, on TV screens all over the world. The country was being placed on the mental maps of viewers who were watching Ukrainian cities and towns being bombed more or less live. The journalists who had been sent to Ukraine a few months prior, as the Russian troops had been swarming around the country's borders, finally had the picture they came for. Explosions on the horizon of the ancient city of Kyiv, a capital city so similar to the ones from which their viewers were watching these um, war reports. When I first arrived in the UK, most locals didn't have a clue where Ukraine was. And the knowledge of those who did was limited to Chernobyl and Shevchenko, not the 19th century romantic poet, but uh, the, the founder of the nation, Taras Shevchenko, but Andriy Shevchenko, a footballer who was popular at the time. When the Orange Revolution happened in 2004, the map of Ukraine briefly appeared on TV screens of Westerners. 
The reporters were frequently based in Moscow and had little knowledge of the country they were actually reporting on, painted Ukraine as split between pro-Europeans and pro-Russians. In 2014, Ukraine's life on the Western screens was more prolonged uh, than 10 years earlier, but the narratives were still oversimplified and heavily influenced by Russian propaganda, attempts to dis discredit Ukrainians' fight um, against authoritarianism. Ukraine continued to be misunderstood. It was just too complex to get one's head around, and at the same time, there was no pressing need to get one's head around it. The occupation of Crimea and Russian aggression in the Donbass um, brought Ukraine back into newsrooms. As Ukrainians kept losing lives in the fight for their territorial integrity, they were gaining clarity of vision about the country that they were building with blood, sweat, and tears. But having expressed the deep concern, the world moved on. Ukraine fatigue descended until the full-scale invasion in 2022, when things began to change and the world decided that it was time to discover this terra incognita. You've been in touch with us before with some ideas for collaboration on a project on Ukraine, haven't you? I heard a question from the program manager of yet another important Western cultural institution that had decided to do an event on Ukraine, but had quickly figured out that it didn't have in-house expertise to make sure that they got things right at such a sensitive time. That was me, yes, I responded. But it didn't seem to have worked out then for you, I added cautiously, trying to make a point but not wishing to offend. It didn't. Well, that's because uh, my interlocutor looked for the words to explain why a project on Ukraine had not seemed timely for their organization a year or so ago, the last time we spoke. Ukraine was not trending then. Um, there was no war on, right? Except there was a war on. But Western Europeans could afford to ignore it to the point that they seem to have persuaded themselves that Russia's war in Ukraine began on the 24th of February 2022. The cultural institution I was talking to could no longer afford to ignore the war, if not because it was claiming so many more lives and threatening security in Europe as a whole, then because it would look bad when other similar institutions had done an event on Ukraine, but theirs hadn't. I didn't work out last time, that's true, but now is an opportune moment, said my interlocutor. An opportune moment. So that's what it was for them. In, may, in many ways, it was true. Wars can present opportunities for change that seem impossible in peacetime. From granting rights to women, at least some rights to some women, to changing migration policies to accommodate war refugees, at least some war refugees, to introducing sanctions against an, an aggressor, at least some sanctions. Those opportunities tend to come at a very high cost. The cost is measured in people's lives. Before the 24th of February, 2022, Russia's aggression had already caused much destruction, pain, and grief. Nearly two million Ukrainians had been displaced, mostly internally, so the EU didn't need to worry about accommodating them. 7% of the Ukrainian territory had been occupied by Russia, which meant the people in Crimea and Donbass were living in constant threat of being kidnapped, tortured or murdered if they opposed the regime or if the thugs in charge of their cities decided that they wished to appropriate their flats, cars or businesses. Thousands had been killed. None of that was big enough to bring about change. Towns and cities razed to the ground, thousands of civilians killed by shelling or shot in the head at close range, thousands more tortured, injured, made homeless, millions displaced within Ukraine and in the EU. That seemed to be sufficient to bring the world's attention to Ukraine. The size of the loss, it turns out, matters when it comes to opportune moments. I had the urge to say all of this when speaking to the cultural institution program manager and when I was asked to explain the country that no longer fit the image of the godforsaken corrupt post-Soviet space with its people who displayed defiance when they were expected to display victimhood. I wanted to ask why Ukraine had been of no interest to them for the last eight years or the last 30 years, but I didn't. <laughs> 
Instead, I asked how I could be of help. I had to recognize that for Ukraine, too, this was an opportune moment. This was the moment when the situational interest in Ukraine that emerged as a result of Russia's full-scale invasion had to be turned into structural changes. These changes were needed not only to finally get to know Ukraine as it really was, and not as Russia presented it, but also to understand the challenges that Russia's aggression presented to the wider world. It was an opportunity for the rest of the democratic world to ask the question that was being answered in Ukraine. What is the cost of freedom? This was the moment when having shown the world its resilience, self-reliance and collective strength, Ukraine had to stop being the object of patronizing lecturing and become a subject with experience that was of existential value to the world. I am not a fan of comparing affairs of states or nations to those between people. For instance, explaining the relationship between Russia and Ukraine through a metaphor of a divorce that's gone badly. But there is something in the way Ukraine has been perceived in the West that I recognize from my personal experience. Being an immigrant and a woman, it has always been a struggle to have my voice heard, sometimes quite literally. To have the courage to raise my hand and ask a question in a Q&A session when all other raised hands were those of older men. To speak with enough confidence so that people listened not to my accent, trying and failing to place it on their mental maps, but to the meaning behind my words. To break through a wall of ignorance veiled as superior knowledge. I lived in the world of ubiquitous epistemic mistrust. As the doors that had previously been shut began to open, and people who would not have given a second thought to Ukraine began to arrange talks, write op-eds, curate exhibitions on the country, they started to look for Ukrainian voice that could explain to them everything from Volodymyr the Great to Volodymyr Zelensky, preferably in five minutes that they had allocated for this, and preferably in the most accessible form. However, while being given the voice, I still felt like someone who, had expect, who, who was expected to contribute her ethnic knowledge. For instance, explaining to pronounce an unreasonable combination of consonants in Zaporizhia. Or as someone who could talk emotionally and passionately just before the real commentators were brought on to discuss the same issues objectively. While being invited to participate in a conversation, I was not being invited to steer it. The familiar epistemic mistrust was turning into epistemic exploitation. It took a while for me to decide that this was the opportune moment, not only to fill the huge gap in the knowledge on Ukraine, but also to shape the questions that I was being asked. To retain attention on Ukraine when the discussion turned to Russia to promote Ukrainian anti-imperial literature to those who bemoaned decolonization of Pushkin, Tolstoy, and Dostoevsky. To not only encourage epistemic trust of Ukraine, but also reveal the epistemic value of the experience possessed by the country and its people, the country that surprised the world. The international community gave it between three hours and three days before it falls to Russian aggression. Instead, we witnessed unprecedented resilience of the state and defiance of its people. The people for whom the lines from Shevchenko, the poet, not the footballer, were not some sort of dusty words pulled out of a drawer once a year to be recited by the monument with pathos. Since the 19th century, when they were written, they have served as a call to action. In 2014, when Shevchenko's portraits, creatively dressed as uh, one of the protesters, peeked through the barricades on the Maidan, um, his words reminded the protesters that the fight was just. Since February 2022, they are a statement of fact. I'm quoting. Keep fighting and you will prevail. God himself will aid you. Truth and glory stand beside you and the holy freedom. The Ukrainian people do not venerate their polit political leaders. Unlike in Russia, politicians lose the support of their dissolution electorate as soon as they betray their promises, which is usually very, very quickly after being elected. 
what Ukrainians do revere is freedom. This value of freedom was shaped by the lived experience of generations who were forbidden from speaking their language or even perceiving it as a language, denied statehood and thus political representation, whose culture was belittled and misunderstood. The culture that expressed the urgency of freedom from external colonizers and internal oppression for the nation's survival. But if this culture is spoken or recorded in a language that isn't really perceived as a language, why bother exploring it? Epistemic mistrust of the entire nation, its people, and culture created a gap in the world's imagination the size of 200 square miles, which is 15 times bigger than the Netherlands. If we fill this gap with everything from Pushkin to Putin, how are we to overcome the epistemic mistrust of Ukrainians? How will we understand that for Ukrainians, freedom is not something to be taken for granted, like it is for some peoples west of Ukraine, or something to be feared, like in the country to the east. It is something to be experienced. As Ukrainians are fighting for their freedom with everything they have, from weapons to words, what an opportune moment it is for the world to discover what inspires them. Thank you very much. Um, yes, it's working again, right? And uh, what I forgot to say was welcome also to those of you who are joining us via the live stream. I didn't say that at the beginning, but we're very happy that you're with us here too. Thank you so much, Arendt, for a lecture, which of course I knew when you were going to say it's very crude. I knew it was going to be very crude in your terms, which means very nuanced, maybe even parts of it hard to follow for some people because of the dense historical detail. Thank you so much. Alicia, thank you so much also. You are so clearly not just a scholar, but also a writer. I think, uh, how did you just put it, William? Uh, uh, Alicia's recent key, she, she recently read a keynote in, uh, at the National Slavic Conference. I don't know how to put it. I guess the National Slavic Conference in the UK. Bassi's, um, and uh, the way William just put it was, this was the first Bassi's keynote that went viral, right? People on Twitter just kept talking about it, and they are still talking about it, I think, now, even though it's a month ago already. Um, and I think that's for a reason. Um, I think that you s step in as a very important voice in a debate about Ukraine at that very important moment with such sharp words that even I, as a moderator, I always love to start discussions, but I'm sort of still digesting those words and listening myself. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm not spe speechless, but <laughs> close to. Um, so I will start with a very simple question and then, um, uh, then I'll open the floor also to the audience. One thing that I'm wondering about, it's a very practical thing and we can return to some of the other topics that you <coughs> talked about. Um, this is the question, uh, how do we, well, what do some of the questions that you are asking, some of the problems that you are touching upon, what do they mean for teaching programs? Here at the University of Amsterdam, for instance, for years already, we are trying to think hard about you know, the fact that due in part to budget cuts, we have four programs, Russian, Polish, Czech, uh, and Serbian, Croatian, Bosnian, which is three languages in one. That in itself is an interesting... Um, sometimes difficult move program-wise. But so there are four Slavic languages which are central to our program, and we are teaching courses where we want to talk about Central and Eastern Europe in a maximally informed and nuanced way, but already long before this uh, uh, sort of, well, more full-scale invasion in Ukraine happened this year, we've been thinking, but what about Belarus? What about Ukraine? What about... <laughs> Uh, many other parts of Central and Eastern Europe that we are not talking about right now. So um, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on what are good and practical ways <laughs> to make interventions in teaching programs, to, to adjust them, uh, to uh, make them more responsible knowledge-wise. I, I guess I'll leave it at that. Um, Alessia Arendt. <laughs> That's fine. Uh, only short. Uh, 
uh, of course, uh, the fact that we have been forced to reduce our teaching programs uh, is an illustration of the, uh, um, let's say, lack of importance of uh, the region from uh, a Dutch point of view, uh, the authorities who take decisions. Now, perhaps that will change now. Let's hope that it will change. Now, uh, um, we do not have time, but what is possible, what I uh, tried to do, uh, seven, eight years, uh, six, seven years ago, uh, when uh, I gave an introduction uh, um, uh, about romanticism for first-year students, so that was about Mitzkevich and Pushkin. Now, um, um, Mitzkevich wrote uh, about Petersburg, which, from his point of view, is a, uh, a city uh, which is imitative and created by Satan, etc. It's all very negative. Um, um, uh, now, Pushkin, in uh, his uh, what is it, Bronze Horseman, wrote enthusiastically uh, about St. Petersburg. Now, uh, there is a long poem by Shevchenko, The Dream, uh, uh, which is partly set in St. Petersburg and essentially is also a recapitulation of the uh, uh, history of the Cossacks, the fate of the Cossacks, how they were uh, oppressed uh, by Peter the Great. Uh, now, it would be possible if we had time to introduce uh, that poem um, in this course and to uh, uh, use it as a context for Mitzkevich and Pushkin and Mitzkevich and Pushkin as a context for Shevchenko. Yeah, so you mean on, on an equal basis. Yeah. yeah. So that is, a, 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 perhaps I will simply try that next year. Yes. Thank you, that's a nice and very concrete example. And maybe even now that we don't have time, because <laughs> we won't get an extra course or extra hours, I guess, it could be interesting to at least try to think of creative ways to bring that extra voice in in that particular course, right? Mm -hmm. Thanks for that example. Olesia, that's an what would your suggest suggestions be? That's an excellent example. I think my suggestions will be very similar to that. And I will share a couple of observations, not because I know more than you guys do, I certainly don't, but because I spent the last 10 years or so teaching um, Russian, Soviet, or East European history, and Ukraine never existed on any of those reading lists. And if yes, it did, in another lecture, I heard very interestingly how you explained how also uh, with uh, like teaching directors, you were struggling to, and kept on saying, no, but we also need to talk about Ukraine, right? And how that yeah. kept on being sidestepped. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it always sort of fell between the cracks, basically. It was kind of too European for so for Russian uh, history or even Soviet history and too sort of Soviet for East European history that tended to focus on Poland or Central East European tended to focus on Poland, Czech, Czech Republic and so on. Um, and even with my own PhD, and that's an example you're probably referring to when I said that I wanted to focus on Ukraine, I was advised by well-wishers not to because I won't find a job teaching it and they were right. And, and unless we make those jobs, then of course I won't find them right? So um, th th these are the kind of challenges I had to face practically and what I did um, in my attempts to reintroduce Ukraine is to make sure that we study the centers through the lens of periphery because it's perfectly possible to teach uh, Russian history or especially Soviet history and not just possible but advisable I would say from the point of view say of Kyiv. Right, and introduce uh, uh, introduce discussions of other republics or relevant to other republics in the Soviet Union and not as optional reading towards the end of the reading list, but actually as central key texts. And I know it's being done more and more, but probably not sufficiently so. But another example for me is to, um, the, the one of the courses that I devised was on gender and violence, right? So the, and, and gender and violence can be studied in any context. So I thought, why not teach gender and violence through examples of East Central Europe and Russia, right? And then you can focus on so many different uh, case studies, and a lot of them will be from, you know, will be really good examples from our region because there's there's a lot to be said in participation of women in, say, the Second World War in guerrilla uh, uh, resistance, nationalist resistance, and so on. So these are other creative ways, but they're less creative. Sorry, and I'll stop there. Less creative ways to fund, find funding. I mean, and and if you're told that if we are being constantly told that there is no demand, that is. No, not true. And I have evidence now to say that it's not entirely true that there's no demand to study Ukraine because as director of the Ukrainian Institute we've, um, we've over the last two years we launched uh, two courses, one on literature of Ukraine and another one on history of Ukraine. And we did not give any formal qualifications at the end of those courses. They were completely oversubscribed. 
already the past years, right? The past two years. So exactly. no, 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 no. So before the full scale invasion, actually, the the history course started on the day Putin gave one of his insane speeches, and we were watching him basically declare war on Ukraine as we were studying the Kiev and Rus, which was uh, absolutely mind blowing. Yes. But yeah, no, f we have to fund languages because for you to introduce that Shevchenko poem, you have to have a good translation, and a lot of translations are dated. Most of translations are dated. We need good translations of Shevchenko. We don't have them, but we need money for that, and we need money to teach the next generation of translators to translate. Mm -hmm. Thank you. At the next lecture in this series, actually, we will be, we hope to also uh, invite here uh, some of the, um, the um, currently most active translators of Ukrainian literature here, and we will pay them, <laughs> which is very important. Yes, uh, to attract funding is important. Okay, as I said, I want to open the floor to the audience. I do want to add something to what you said, especially about this point on gender and violence. For me, that's interesting, and in, in maybe for some others here, it can be relevant too, or, or for students thinking about this topic. I remember an evening with a well-known Ukrainian writer, Oksana Zabushko, here in the Netherlands, where I was very frustrated uh, because the only questions that she were asked were questions like, uh, how does it feel to be in, in a country at war? And well, there were only questions about repressions, whereas she writes also about repression and war, but also about violence in much more general terms, gender and violence, metaphysical poetry about her dacha garden, etc. So we were trying to open up the discussion, but the moderator kept returning only to those political topics. And to me, it sounds really interesting to integrate or fold her into such a course rather than uh, a course uh, on, I don't know, uh, Eastern European war history, for instance. So to think about the angle with which you start, that that's that's what I take from your comment as an interesting suggestion. Thank you so much. Um, who wants to ask a question in the audience? I see a question right here on row one. Yeah. Thank you very much for an eye-opening and spirited introduction. Um, what I missed and what I would like to have your reaction to is that, in my mind, the sudden and unexpected change of heart in, in Finland and Sweden is a very powerful validation of the relevance of Ukraine. What is your view on that? Thank you. I, I mean, this is this is a really interesting turn of events. Especially, I would like those uh, to take note of of this turn of events who have been saying that NATO provoked Putin, uh, and that you know NATO expansion provokes Putin. And because I mean, and again, you know, to remind ourselves that Ukraine was a neutral state, and there was a lot of skepticism about joining NATO before 2014 in Ukraine. And it only started to change as the violence progressed, violence inflicted by Russia progressed. And we're seeing the same thing happening elsewhere. So I think it should be a wake-up call to a lot of those people who uh, want to negotiate with Putin, want to enforce peace uh, on a man who is absolutely not interested in peace whatsoever. Uh, let, this is not entirely answering a question, but I think it really shows that there are uh, that there is knowledge in the region that, that has sort of first first hand experience of dealing with Russia as an imperialist state um, th that we need to listen to, um, that the kind of epistemic trust that I was talking about, right, that, you know, the, they know that this is not the time for negotiation because the person is not interested in negotiation at all. And one, one thing I wanted to just mention briefly about, you know, the, the fact that Putin isn't interested in peace is because it's war that, ke that brought him into power, it's wars that keep him in power. For as long as he's fighting wars, and especially if he's not suffering too much from uh, sanctions and regardless of the strength of sanctions, I mean, we're seeing unprecedented levels, but before that we didn't. And if oil and gas is still, you know, uh, supporting his funding, his war, he's, uh, he's benefiting from it because he can use uh, the threat of uh, this sort of uh, enemy that spreads from Kyiv to Washington um, as, as the means to control his own population, to, to uh, not, uh, you know, to keep repressing them to keep keep them silent and poor and to keep keep them turned away from the fact that it's he and his cronies who stole the money from his own people um, and I think you know people in the region realize that very well and realize that he's not interested in peace and for that reason you know they're trying to protect themselves to the best of their ability maybe one comment here yeah. 
I was recently at a, at a, at a symposium about uh, two days before the war, war broke out, where uh, a Dutch military historian sp spoke, uh, General Osingha, and it was about the analogy between Ukraine and Taiwan. And um, the word fin Finlandization was dropped, and he remarked that the, fin the Finns got fuming angry by using this word. And, and I think that with their immediate uh, application to NATO uh, membership is a form of this um, um, uh, loss of patience with permanent intimidation. Yeah, just to add, Yaroslav Hrtsak spoke about uh, neutrality, as an, and Yaroslav Hrtsak is a Ukrainian historian, um, about neutrality has never been really a choice. It's a choice that is... Is, is enforced. Yeah, yeah. And with Finlandization, uh, I uh, read a really uh, good comment from Olya Tokaruk, I think, a Ukrainian journalist based mm -hmm, in Ukraine, mm -hmm. who said uh, after Finland uh, declared that they would be joining NATO, they said, finally, the word Finlandization is an acceptable option for Ukraine. <laughs> well, no, because they're applying for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank yeah, you so much. Questions? Any more questions from the audience? Uh, yes, see a couple more questions. Our students are also obliged to ask questions. <laughs> Please do selfies. ask questions and, and take selfies and ask questions. Please feel very uh, welcome. Thank you for a very interesting, yes. le for interesting lectures. Uh, it's a difficult question to ask, but you mentioned gender and violence. And I was talking to a friend of mine who's very active in the cultural world. And she, you know, the, the terrible situation, the war in Ukraine. But she mentioned the fact that every male between the age of 18 and 60 is not allowed to leave the land, the country. And she said, why is that? That's terrible. And so I was thinking, uh, what are your thoughts on that? And is there a role for women in fighting? When... Thank you. Ellen, you have to stop me at some point because this is I something will. that I've been researching and I can talk for hours about it. <laughs> I'll try and be as brief I as will. I can. Um, General mobilization means that uh, people who are obliged to serve have to stay inside the country. And that applies to a vast majority of men between the ages of 18 and 60, although not to all, because some um, are exempt from service. Uh, it also applies to quite a lot of women who are either in the military already, and I'll come back to that, or who are of professions which oblige them to stay in the country um, in times of general mobilization, in particular medics. So a lot of them can't leave either. My very close friend's mother, who's a, a nurse, is not able to leave the country, for instance. Although she hasn't been called up. But she might be, that's the thing. A lot of women also choose to go back, so they will drop yes. their children off uh, to safety, for instance, with their grandparents somewhere in Western Europe or Western Ukraine, and go back to their cities because they work as, uh, I don't know, hospitals, or they work in pharmacies, or anything else that is, you know, kindergartens, I don't know, schools, anywhere else. Uh, so it's a choice. Uh, but for for vast majority of women, that's not necessarily an obligation. Now, having said that, after the Maidan, so if you remember the Maidan protests, 50% of the protesters were women um, until the protests turned very violent and women started to essentially be squeezed out of that space by male protesters, although a lot of them still remained and took part in the clashes as well and stood on the barricades and so on. A lot of them joined the armed forces after or the volunteer battalions in 2014. And as they joined, they realized that they were being needed, they were being very useful as combat fighters, as snipers, as drivers, as whoever, mm -hmm. but they were not allowed to register as such in those roles. Because Ukrainian military law and labor law um, still inherited very paternalistic, restrictive practices from the Soviet law. And that meant that most professions at the front or in the army were not available to women. Um, so they would do all of these things. In addition, because it's quite a conservative society, they were expected to cook and clean. And in addition to that, they were registered as seamstresses, as administrators, as God knows what, but not what they were actually doing. It put them in a very difficult position. They were semi-legally or illegally at the front. So if they were killed in action or if they were injured in action, they were not able to access or their families were not able to access the same kind of services as male combatants would. What they did... They created, first of all, they started a, kind of a, a, a large sociological study to show the data and to interview women and to you know, explain what the situation at the front was. Um, and then they started a huge advocacy campaign. 
And that advocacy campaign grew into the change, essentially the change of law. So uh, in 2016, those women who were already part of the armed, forms, uh, of the armed forces were legalized. Um, and then since then, there were several other uh, changes to uh, military law that brought gender equality closer to uh, reality. It's not ideal. There's still a lot to be done. But we do have female generals now. There are more female officers. And most importantly, women can serve legally. At the beginning, I am about to finish. I, uh, I have a follow-up <laughs> question rather than a At, a at the beginning of, a, of, a, of the <laughs> full-scale invasion, um, about 22% of the Ukrainian armed forces were women. So it's a really high percentage already. Um, about 13% are service women. Um, so the, 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 the fighting force. And since then, and I don't know, I, I have I've seen different figures, but because we are also including territorial defense, and the territorial defense is basically civilians who have joined, uh, joined up, but they are also part of the Ukrainian armed forces as a kind of another arm of the Ukrainian armed forces. The figure, the number of women in the armed forces altogether is over 30%, which is huge. So you can see that women do choose a lot of women do choose to take up arms and join either the armed forces if they are trained to do so, or the territorial defense and then train to do it. And frankly, I'm not surprised at all because I think a lot of those who want who remain in the country, they do want to uh, be as protected as they as they can be, seeing the kind of atrocities that uh, that are being perpetrated in the temporarily occupied territories. Thank you so much. Well, I, I think. Do you have a follow-up question? <laughs> Thank you, but I also was wondering because she asked, why can't the men that don't want to fight or are not allowed to leave the country? So how should I answer her, her but how question? Can, why can't men? Yeah, ah, be men because leave, be, right? because yeah. we have conscription. Uh, sadly, it's because we have conscriptions. Conscription was supposed to be cancelled, uh, I think, in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. But obviously, that that went out of the window pretty quickly when when Putin attacked. Um, yeah, because we have conscription, and it only applies to men at the moment. I mean, again, that might change uh, once peace is restored, and it might we might have. I I don't envisage Ukraine that won't have conscription anytime soon, but it might start to apply to women as well. Yeah, I read about some exceptions, right, as when women are about to give birth to a child, then men can join them for a short time abroad. It also right? it like depends this. how many children but, you but have. modest. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's, there's a lot of exemptions uh, for men, but the vast majority are uh, obliged to at least be available for duty. Thank you. I have a question before we, and then we return to the audience. Um, I have a question about, I don't know, Taiwan was mentioned, some other uh, regions were, were mentioned, some other world regions. I wondered, um, at previous occasions which we organized, some of our students will remember this also, uh, around the developments in Ukraine, uh, we were speaking about Ukraine and Russia and the war there, and then very often in the discussion, um, the question would come up, but what about... Um, Syria. What about uh, other places in the world uh, that also deserve our attention? And what I've been wondering about is, I'm sure that you got this question, when you say where is Ukraine on the mental map of the academic community, people then ask you, yes, and where is Syria on the mental map of the academic community or Belarus, etc. What do you do when people ask that? I'm asking that, I hope that you understand that as somebody who understands that I really appreciate actually how you uh, how you turn this metaphor of the opportune moment around. I think this is a very important moment to ask that question, specifically for Ukraine. At the same time, I always really appreciate it when, for instance, Syrian students in the audience ask us that question. I think, yes, it's, it's a question that merits a serious answer. So what do you do when people ask you that question? Actually, nobody's asked me that question, which is okay. interesting. And I, I wonder why. I mean, I sort of have, You're ex very welcome. <laughs> I have expected it. And not that I have a rehearsed answer, not at all, because I keep no, thinking no, no, about no. it yeah. myself uh, all the time. And I think my answer is, yeah, totally, yeah. Well, what about all of these other places? This is an opportunity for us not to just think about them separately, but think about all of them and us not noticing them until now right mm -hmm. the same with refugees so one thing that we often hear oh ukrainian refugees are being accepted in european states but what about those refugees mm -hmm. that were turned away so you know th that's what i was saying you know wars are create opportunities for us to look at our immigration policies something that perhaps hasn't happened in the uk sadly but has happened in in europe and i think that can then be applied to you know to improve other refugees war refugees chances of settling and on moving and being and being welcomed in a different way i would not say 
like, you know, because some refugees received bad treatment, therefore Ukrainians should receive bad treatment. No, let's learn from practices mm -hmm. when we do actually get it right, which does, doesn't happen that often, but it happens sometimes. And one, one other thing that I'd like to add is that, you know, there's been a lot of scholarly work done on decolonization elsewhere in the world. But often when I do hear those scholars speak, all right, they simply do not see Russia as an imperialist state. They simply do not uh, see those discussions as valid. They somehow buy into Kremlin propaganda. And that's when I think we should come together and talk together and share our knowledge and share our examples and teach each other mm -hmm. um, to, you know, to, to see these things more broadly and in, in, in a comparative way. Thanks so much. Yeah, yes. so, so yes. the, the, yeah, uh, yes. go ahead. Only a short remark. Um, yes, when I hear these questions, uh, which are asked by people who, of course, often have the best intentions, but are in safety or relative safety, uh, perhaps they are less safe than they actually think, uh, then I think that is infuriating. So um, uh, um, um, asking people who are exposed to danger what about Syria? Of course, yeah, Syria yeah. is Well, important. sometimes, as I Syria said, for instance, important. at a very emotional meeting, or very, well, an intellectually stimulating meeting where there were also emotions resonating in the room just after the war broke out. I know some of you here were there too. Uh, war at our door. Uh, uh, we had also Syrian students asking this question. Yes, so then they come from a very is, different... That is yeah. authentic. That is yeah, authentic. Yeah, and, and not in a violent way, in a very yeah. respectful way. And then I think I appreciate your answer. This was also then more or less our answer. So indeed, where is Syria and where is Belarus and where are many other world regions on the mental map of the academic community? Um, but I also understand your reserve, Arendt, uh, as to easy yes, 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 what about yes, ism. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you. There was a, an excuse simply. Yeah, to yeah, do this happens too. Yeah, thank you to, to those, I think, both uh, different but both important responses to that question. There was a question, sorry, <laughs> in the very back of the room. <laughs> One to last row in the back. And then I think there was one here, right? Yeah, and another one. Yeah. Uh, hi, my name is Victoria, and um, I'm together with my two goddaughters here and my friend, and we are originally from Bucha in Irpin. Uh, luckily, I, was, uh, I moved here a bit earlier, and my uh, yeah, family uh, managed to escape from there. But um, I have more like practical questions, maybe. Um, we have the children who are really like feel hate to the Russians and uh, at the same time we want to be uh, we, we want to stay and remain like really human being so maybe you have some kind of uh, um, I mean I'm, I'm an adult yeah and uh, can um, cope with my feelings but uh, how to explain children who were driving in the car uh, under the bombs basically do you have any practical uh, like advice for them and because why I'm asking you you definitely have the um, uh, students uh, who are Russians or who Russian oriented or um, yeah but they are still human being yeah we we all human so do you have any practical uh, advice uh, to these uh, children and yeah how they have to cope with this and how you do this uh, seeing all this uh, news and know that it is really exist and this is not fake Thank you Thank so you. much for sharing this and, and sharing this very important uh, but also very personal question. I guess it's directed maybe to all of us, including me probably. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe I first give the floor to the speakers if that's okay. And, or me, shall I start? I find it, uh, I find it uh, very difficult to answer that question. Uh, and again, I point to my own situation of relative safety and my inability to imagine such a situation, which perhaps in the past to a certain extent uh, has been experienced by, by, by my parents, by grandparents. But it, it is something we, uh, about which it is very difficult to speak from a Western perspective. So perhaps you have... Well, yeah, I think it's a very difficult question too, so I don't have a ready-made answer straight away. One thing that I can say is that uh, at the very beginning of this evening I spoke of the University of New Europe, uh, and for this uh, university in the making we also created a mentor program. Uh, in fact, if, if your children need advice on study programs, for instance, I would be really happy if you could come up to me afterwards. Yes, yes, okay, so let's please uh, uh, be in touch and then uh, maybe directly also with, <laughs> with your daughters. Uh, and uh, we can connect them to a personal mentor that will make it easier to find a suitable study program. So that's also on practical matters. Um, but for that mentor program, uh, we are trying to consistently say we want both there, but also in this university in the making, 
we want it to be a place both for Ukrainians at risk, but also for Russians and Belarusians who suffer from the Putinist regime. And there are many of such Russians and uh, Belarusians, for instance, people who flee Russia um, uh, and then their credit cards are instantly blocked. Uh, so often their parents are angry with them. I, for instance, am in touch. Let me, just, let me just tell you indeed one concrete example and then I'll give the floor to Alessia. But I think this is a good example which may make it easier to humanize that picture of the Russian. One person with whom I've been in touch a lot in the past weeks is a Russian PhD student who is so uh, angry and morally outraged by the war against Ukraine that she fled Russia together with her husband. Um, they fled first to Turkey and their bank cards were blocked. Their parents didn't want to speak to them anymore, uh, but nevertheless they persevered. Their uh, employer, an, a, a Russian academic institution, was extremely intimidating and threatening to, um, uh, to fire them. This is something else than being under bombs. That's very clear. That's a different situation. But this person was extremely uh, traumatized and we had several conversations where it was very clear that it was, uh, and still is to this day, um, for her impossible to think of how to proceed her life. She has had to leave everything behind. And her nationality is Russian, but she suffers from the Putinist regime. And there are also examples of Belarusians who suffer from this regime. And so in this mentor program in the university uh, to which I'm devoting much of my time now, we're trying to at least consistently continue to say all of those groups merit our attention. First, Ukrainians, because that simply that group is the biggest and the threat is the most acute there. Um, but the best way to move forward is to not overlook those groups of Russians and Belarusians who have no affinity with the Putinist regime whatsoever and who are also its victim. I don't know, I guess that's a, that's a very partial and imperfect answer to your very important question, but that would be my answer. Thank you, Ellen. Well, I'm really glad that you said that, that obviously there are very different groups of yes. victims of Putin's yes. regime, and some of them will be Russians, but that you do distinguish between yes. these victims because we do have very clear priority of needs mm -hmm. at the moment. Having your card blocked or even being threatened with being sent to jail is very different from being in Bucha or Irpin during occupation mm -hmm. and having your house blown, uh, blown up or having your job taken away. Remember about five million Ukrainians lost their jobs since the start of the full-scale invasion and obviously not to mention those who lost their loved ones, homes and everything else. So that also applies to creating some kind of reconciliatory discussions. Mm -hmm. I think there's good intentions behind them, but I think it's really important for people who do want to create them not to, <laughs> because now is not the time for them. Well, not that's another thing. We have, for instance, also mentors in this program who do not want to mentor uh, a Russian man at the moment. And then the last thing that I would do is to try to persuade uh, uh, such a mentor to say, oh, but this is also a human being, then we just say, that's fine. Then you are not going to do that and we're not going to try to bring you around the same table with that person. This is not the moment for that. Ukrainians keep getting invited to say, you know, discussions of culture or cinema or music or something like that together with their Russian counterparts and somehow the organizers don't see a problem with that. And I think it is really important to understand that it's just extremely emotionally difficult to share that platform at the moment until the war is over, until um, Russian troops, Russian command and Russian leadership is punished for, for war crimes and so on, and until there's some kind of sense of justice. But thank you so much for that really honest question and such a, you know, for, for having the bravery to be vulnerable in this room, for putting your hand up, because I know it's not easy to ask that question. I've been talking to a lot of my friends about it. There's so many of us who feel so much hatred and it's perfectly normal. It's totally normal to feel that at the moment. And some of them say that they are managing to channel it uh, in direction that is, um, uh, if, you know, to be efficient, to be effective, you know, to do a lot for Ukraine and so on. Uh, and other, but, but more, even more speak of love. And I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, I, when all of this started, when the full scale invasion started and um, I began to see how emotionally destroyed my contacts, my friends, my really close people to me are, especially those who are still in Ukraine, I um, wanted to say to them, oh God, I know how you feel, 
because I lost my brother five years before that, and I sort of went through a lot of those emotions myself, but I realized that I didn't know how they felt because it was different then. He was in the armed forces. I didn't lose a civilian brother who was just killed in a war crime. You know, he was already fighting. He made that choice himself. I managed to bury him. He's buried in a cemetery, not in a mass grave and so on. So I didn't know exactly how he felt. But I, I, I also found it, and I've been thinking about this a lot and trying to write about it as well. I also found it disturbing that I didn't feel the, sen the feeling of hatred. Uh, and I sometimes even thought, oh, I wish I did because I can see that it gives some kind of power and, you know, sense of relief when you can be, you know, you can say these words of hatred and so on. Uh, but I didn't feel it. And I think it partly I, I, I didn't feel it in the same way because um, when I had felt it five years before, uh, I realized that it was really destroying me from inside. It was, it was really, really ruining, every, it was taking up everything that I had. It was consuming me entirely. Um, and I thought, well, I really don't want to be consumed by hatred. I, I really have no idea how to speak to children about this, but maybe uh, speaking to anybody, adults or children, to explain that, you know, that um, if, if we can um, do something for, for Ukraine and channel these difficult emotions that we have, why not, why not try and, you know, accept the fact that we feel these negative emotions, but try and focus also on, on that absolutely overwhelming love that we feel for Ukraine, because I see it absolutely everywhere at the moment. I feel people expressing love for one another, uh, this comradeship, this friendship that appeared, this in, in immense sense of solidarity, and just patriotism that I think a lot of people in safer countries simply fail to understand because their statehood has not been threatened. And it's sometimes perceived as nationalism, and we're so used to um, seeing nationalism as something bad. Mm -hmm. But in Ukraine, nationalism at the moment is civic nationalism. It means standing up for, for human dignity, standing up for one another, understanding that regardless of your differences, linguistic, political, social, any difference, you are here to fight for the same cause, and that cause is freedom, is not end up in a police state, right, you know, and not end up in occupation. And I think if we switch our attention or try and switch our attention towards that feeling of love that, that, that is so powerful as well, that, then it might be slightly easier to balance it out with the negative emotions too. Thank you so much for uh, also, uh, yes. Thank you. That's actually also for, for me and our mentor program an instructive answer. I made, I made several notes, <laughs> really important. Um, and uh, I wanted to add one thing. Yes, actually our own university, the University of Amsterdam, I think has on the one hand tried to do something very noble by saying from the very start of this war, we want to reach out to both Ukrainian but also Russian and Belarusian st st students and staff members. But at the same time, this has also backlash because they did not distinguish and say, well, these are equal groups um, uh, and we want to help all Russian and all Belarusian students. And it's very understandable, I think, that that has backlash and that this has caused controversy and debate. So it's a, it's a complex but very important discussion. Thank you for bringing it up and thank you once again also for, um, for sharing uh, this question and also some personal details related to it. Um, we had a question here and then I keep forgetting. Yes, then we, we return to the first row. We have enough time. <laughs> um, that's fine. We'll, we'll manage. <laughs> Um, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still in a bit of a post-COVID brain fog, so I'm, I'm struggling to formulate the question. But um, I'm from Norway, where we have a short, little border with Russia. Uh, we have talked to the people on the other side of that little border as Russians before the 1917 revolution, in the Soviet times, uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But we are. I think for many people in the area, they're shocked to find that a lot of their neighbors, who have been referring to as Russians for decades, have Ukrainian heritage. The Kola Peninsula has, has quite a big population of, uh, of people with Ukrainian heritage. Of course, we have more extreme examples, as on Svalbard, uh, an island, an archipelago on the, 
uh, Norwegian jurisdiction where we have Russian run settlements which, of which half the population, at least half the population, are Ukrainian miners. So <laughs> there, are, there are some. But I suppose what I'm, I'm, I'm hinting at, what I want to, to hear something about, is uh, the role of Ukrainian identities in Russia and how they might pan out in the long run in this, in this war. That's about as, as sharp as I can formulate at the moment. Sorry. I guess this is a question, uh, maybe first of all to Olesia, and then if you want to compliment, please do, Aaron. Mm -hmm. I think I will only have to respond with anecdotal uh, sort of response based on <clears throat> my family mostly, really. Um, I, I have never studied Ukrainian communities in Russia, and I'm sure there are some very good studies of it, and it's actually that's actually something I'm going to try and look up and see because uh, there's plenty of very active, or there used to be anyway. I know that they've been being repressed since at least since 2014. Some some of the centers have closed down. I know in Novosibirsk, I'm pretty sure the Ukrainian center was closed down, and bookshops were closed down, and library collections were taken away. A lot of this kind of stuff has been happening systematically. So I wonder if anything's actually survived in a kind of uh, structural way. I very much doubt it. If it exists, it's probably an underground, some kind of uh, uh, samvedav. I will not use the <laughs> Russian word samizdat, because in this case it's samvedav, the Ukrainian word, you know, sort of underground literature, um, if they do exist. But it's something I will look into. In terms of um, Ukrainians who live in Russia, a lot of my family moved to Russia uh, in the Soviet times, so um, by choice, not necessarily exiled. Um, uh, some assimilated, some uh, most assimilated, right? Um, it's not about blood. It's not about ethnicity. It's about what political nation you choose to belong to and how you perceive your citizenship. Um, when my brother was killed, uh, they, some of them still spoke to my mother. This is mostly family on my mother's side, mm, but not very many. And if she brought it up and she went on the phone, if she just tried to discuss, the situation, they would, one, one branch of the family specifically said to her, look, we know exactly what is going on. We watch TV. <laughs> and that was really telling. And that was the last conversation she had with them that never called again. And since February, um, even those that I was, cousins that I was closely in touch with, regularly talking about, I've never, I've not been discussing politics with my cousins for a long time because I did not want to put them in danger. Mm, or draw anybody's attention to them. Um, but we've, you know, stayed in touch talking about their children or whatever. I haven't received a single text, mm. nothing. It's just complete disappearance. And we can, we can talk about fear, of course, as a factor in this. But, but, but fear, ignorance, uh, all of these things are, are choices that people make. Can I just ask, because you said that um, this answers your question, right? This was what you were asking for. Okay, thank you so much. We had a question here on the front row, and then we're also nearing half past. If there's time, we'll have one more question. Hello. Um, in his uh, speech just before the beginning of the war, uh, uh, Putin more or less denied Ukraine any existence. Um, in the years... Uh, in the last years, there was, if there was a t a talked about Ukraine, it was about sort of a Russian Ukraine and a Ukrainian Ukraine, right? There were people who speak Russian, they were orientated towards Russia, and that's what the Russians wanted us to believe, right? In, in, in today's commentar commentaries uh, uh, of, of journalists, you still hear a certain surprise. Ha, uh, oh, hey, they hate the Russians, even though they speak Russian. So my question is, what was true about this Russian Ukrainians and Ukrainian Ukrainians story in the last in the last thirty years? I think yeah, yeah, Olesia, but then I think also Arend. I see some <laughs> responses. Yeah, no, no, let's start, Olesia. <laughs> Nothing let's was true. <laughs> I think that's, that could be a that's short a answer, answer, at least from what Putin says. And let's, 
yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and let's not treat his statements, his lectures, his uh, his writing as some kind of valid historical things. It's 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 a war. Uh, it's weapon of war. No, I understand that you no, understand. No, no, I'm not referring to what Putin said. Right. I'm referring to what journalists said uh, in the previous years. Yeah. You know. There's an Eastern Ukraine and there's a Western Ukraine and there are more or less two different countries. That's what is, and that's still in the mind of many Western European people. True, it's definitely true that it's in the mind of people and it's in the mind of journalists who constantly ask me that same question that, that I was trying to talk about in, in, the, in the lecture. And the, when they stop is when I ask them back, what is the difference between Ireland and England? Both speak English, uh, you know, they should be the same, like Russophone Ukrainians and Russians, that Putin claims to be the same, right? Um, the, we are all bilingual. So let me, rather than dispelling, because this is what I pledge to do, right? To not uh, respond to, not stay within Putin's framework, but try and go outside of it. Rather than disp dispelling the, these myths, let me tell you what mm, is true. Yeah, and the truth yeah. is that we are all bilingual and multilingual in Ukraine. My generation, I went to school in 1991. I was, I am from Lviv, so Western Ukraine, a Ukrainian-speaking family. I was already not formally taught Russian at school. It was already cancelled. Russian language was cancelled as a subject, a compulsory subject. But I'm bilingual. I can switch any moment and halfway through the sentence with my friends and I won't even notice that I've done it. And, and that is the truth, right? But, uh, but I do speak Ukrainian at home. And there, will be, there were a lot of people who switched from uh, speaking Russian at home to speaking Ukrainian at home in 2014, and even more so now. And those who haven't, again, I have friends from Donbass who just never got the chance to practice their Ukrainian. It's passively there. And we see it with Zelensky, and I don't know if you know, I mean, the guy didn't speak Ukrainian at all when he was being elected. He was fully Russophone. He speaks Ukrainian now, to, to the point that he, when he's being interviewed by Russian journalists, he forgets Russian words. He has to check his assistants, oh, what do you, what do you call uh, medication in Russian again? Because he genuinely forgets, because it's passively there, that knowledge is there. And I was saying that some of my friends who are from Donbass, who always spoke Russian, are now saying, damn, I wish my Ukrainian was better because I dislike the sound of that language when it comes out of my mouth because they associate it with violence. And that's not surprising. That is what he achieved. Mm. He achieved yes. that the Russophone Ukrainians actually associate their native language. And remember, being Russophone and being Russian is not, not the same things, um, especially being politically oriented. <laughs> Because you could be Russian and Russophone and a Ukrainian citizen and really not want to be part of Russia. And if you look at any sociological data that predates 2014 that is actually reliable, there is no evidence of separatism in Donbass. It's manufactured entirely. Yeah, there was a very interesting lecture in the same series where William will uh, uh, perform tomorrow, uh, .ua discussions a few weeks ago by Andriy Portnov, a historian. Um, from uh, uh, University of Yadrina, and he explained that this myth of a divided Ukraine is exactly that, so it's a myth, and he provided really interesting, also historical evidence of how, in fact, this linguistic diversity and other forms of diversity, in fact, are a strength of Ukraine rather than, um, uh, rather than something dividing it in, in destructive ways. Um, uh, only, only a few words. So uh, essentially now we, um, uh, it, it would be necessary uh, to uh, give an overview of uh, Ukraine's history, uh, various territories, the empires to which uh, they b belonged, etc. But it is far too complicated. And now a comment on journalism. Um, there was a time, uh, 40, 50 years ago, when uh, journalists uh, were specialists in, uh, in certain fields. For instance, um, uh, special, uh, uh, Greek history or Russian history, uh, Ukrainian history, uh, rarely, but, but still Polish history. But at the moment, uh, there are a lot of journalists who are not specializing in a particular field, are simply traveling all over the world and... Um, their knowledge is um, is uh, fairly limited, and of course they try to compensate that uh, 
but still uh, the result uh, is often uh, a lot of uh, generalizations which are not very <coughs> adequate. Yeah. There are yeah. exceptions. Uh, yeah, in the um, first lecture in this series we invited um, two good um, counterexamples. Our, <laughs> <student, laughs> our former student who at the moment is uh, a, a journalist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, I was but, thinking um, of two of them, yeah. But yeah. journalism has changed very much. Thank you so, so much. I hope that the last person who wanted to ask a question will forgive me because I also do want to protect your time, but, but please do come to us and, and ask it here. Um, it is already half past, and I want to ask both of you, uh, and so once again, forgive me, and I hope that you will uh, go and ask the question afterwards and that other people will do that too. In concluding, I want to ask both of you very briefly, is there something, we, we talked about cultural identities, we talked about mental maps, geopolitical maps, how they relate to each other, how important assumptions about cultural identities are. Is there something on this topic in one, truly one sentence that you, maybe with a comma, that you want to share with the audience before we conclude? And the answer could be no. <laughs> it's too complicated. That is, a, I, that I is a, not, uh, an acceptable answer. I am not good at answer. inventing one-liners. <laughs> That's a beautiful answer. Thank you, Ad. Very important answer. I, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Savor this applause. Yeah. <laughs> I really want to end uh, with the sort of call to action because I, I think we're still, we, we're, there's still so much ahead of us that we're not prepared for. And it's, it's really quite simple what I'm going to ask you to do. First is stay informed. Please stay informed reading sources that are reliable, preferably Ukrainian sources. There's really good Ukrainian, uh, English language Ukrainian sources with journalists that are based on the ground, that are reporting, um, you know, reporting from the war zone. Um, um, don't read misinformation. Secondly, don't let uh, war fatigue or Ukraine fatigue descend as quickly as it did in 2014. Um, it's up to all of us to keep Ukraine in our minds and in our hearts um, for as long as necessary. And it seems like it might be longer than we would like it to be. Um, and uh, yeah, finally, I guess, stand with Ukraine <laughs> because it matters. It really matters. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Arendt. Thank you, Olesia, very much for your time both. And um, I propose that who wants to can stay uh, to also talk to the speakers uh, now. And I also very warmly invite all of you to our next session, which is on June 9. This will be the next session in this uh, series, Ukraine and Russia, the imagination of a region. It's still in the making, but we will have literary experts there, uh, uh, writers, translators, uh, who are translating uh, Ukrainian literature and writing it. So you're very, very welcome to join. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer, for co-organizing. <laughs>